Hello, all. my name is Max and I'm a recent graduate of the University of Exeter. What I'd like to talk about today is a site that I did a report on as part of my final year of my undergraduate archaeology degree, Wolvesey Palace, also known as the Old Bishop's Palace in Winchester, Hampshire. You can see the ruins of the site at the bottom of the aerial photograph and the modern residence of the bishop, dating back to the 17th century, was actually built right next to it on its left. In this presentation, first I'll give a brief overview of what a medieval bishop's palace was, the development of this one, and its location in the medieval landscape of the city of Winchester and beyond. I'll take you through the development of the site and what we know of the site archaeologically from the excavations of Martin Biddle in the 1960s and 70s. I'll be focusing on the innovations of Henry of Blois in the 12th century AD, the site's artistic detail and defensive capabilities, as well as what we know about the site's position at the centre of an elaborate network of elite trade and travel. Finally, I'll wrap up with what I find so interesting about the site. Wolfsey Palace was the bishop's residence in Winchester from the 10th century onwards. This is a reconstruction of how the palace would have looked in around 1170, roughly the time of the death of Henry of Blois, which I've included because it can be a little hard to imagine what the site looked like from the current ruins. Images like this one can be useful in that way, but I think they can be quite misleading. For instance, in my opinion, this reconstruction makes the palace seem a little bit isolated and cut off from its surroundings. And later in this presentation, I will argue that this wasn't really the case. Bishop's palaces were grand buildings that the bishop would stay in on an itinerant basis. These were immensely powerful political and religious figures with great wealth, which is reflected in the scale and quality of the architecture of the palaces. During turbulent times, such as the anarchy civil conflict of the 12th century, they could be fortified, blurring the line between a palace, usually thought of as a non-fortified elite residence, and a castle. In the case of Wolvesey, it is sometimes known as Wolvesey Castle to distinguish it from the current Bishop's Palace, but I will be referring to it as Wolvesey Palace to reflect its Episcopal or Bishop-related nature. This is a map of the area around Winchester Cathedral and Wolvesey Palace, which is labelled with the orange arrow from around 1300. The enclosure of the site is outlined in red. I wanted to show this image from Martin Biddle's recent chapter on Wolvesey, as I think it gives a really good sense of the palace's access routes from the north and south, the palace's proximity to the cathedral, and some of the immediate features of the surroundings. There's a variety of religious or monastic buildings, economic hubs such as the markets and fairs to the north of the cathedral, and other buildings like mills and hospitals that give a sense of the bustling network of activity taking place around the site. It's always worth thinking about the context to prevent seeing a site as an isolated structure. I'll now give a quick rundown of the important figures associated with the site. The first Bishop of Winchester to live away from Winchester Cathedral was Athelwold I in the 10th century AD. After the Norman Conquest, William Gifford oversaw the construction of the West Hall in stone, some of the ruins of which survive. But the figure who left the most distinctive mark on Wolvesey was Gifford's successor, Bishop Henry of Blois in the 12th century, and I'll introduce him in more detail in the next slide. This picture was taken facing southeast and shows Women's Tower and the southern side of the East Hall, which was built by Bishop Henry. The palace gradually declined in importance over the next few centuries, and the last major event to take place there was the wedding banquets of Queen Mary and Philip of Spain on the 25th of July, 1554, which would have been 467 years ago yesterday. And this event roughly coincides with the end of the medieval period. The palace was reduced to its current ruinous state when it was slighted by the Roundheads in 1646 during the English Civil War. Slighting just means to eliminate it as a defensible location. And it is now owned by English Heritage. So Henry of Blois was an incredibly powerful man and the brother of King Stephen, holding the positions of Abbot of Glastonbury, Bishop of Winchester and the Papal Legate during his lifetime. I've shown a contemporary plaque with the words Henricus Episcopus Bishop Henry along the bottom of the semicircle. It is currently in the British Museum and demonstrates the power and significance of the role of the Bishop of Winchester to be depicted in such a finely crafted manner. 
Quite apart from a peaceful idea of a man of the cloth, Henry was directly involved in castle construction and siege warfare during the turbulent period of civil war, known as the Anarchy from 1135 to 53. He also advised and supported his brother during this period and was involved in negotiations between Stephen and Stephen's cousin and rival, the Empress Matilda. His reputation fluctuated, but he never truly fell from favour, and as an elder statesman, he attempted to reconcile Henry II and Thomas Becket in the 1160s. The Palace of Bishop Henry has been called the most substantial residence of Romanesque England, and we'll now look at the structure in a bit more detail. In this plan from English Heritage, the colour coding shows how much of the palace was constructed during the time of Henry of Bois. The pinkish colour of the West Hall is from the time of William Gifford, while the brown, yellow, green and blue coloured structures are from Henry's time. By his death, the palace had four extended ranges with at least 38 ground floor rooms around a central courtyard. So what did Henry do differently in the development of the palace? The Annals of Winchester describe him building at Wolfsey a house like a palace, a domus quasi palatium. The diagram here shows Gifford's West Hall on the left in comparison to Henry's East Hall to the right. While the earlier hall may look significantly larger, it has been theorised that the room marked C may have actually been a raised planted garden, evening out the sizes slightly. Furthermore, the Great Halls, the central hearts of both the East and West Range, show a marked difference as Henry's Eastern Great Hall is proportionately much bigger. The medieval art scholar Zarnecki suggested that some of the architectural details from Henry's innovations, such as the decorated door jam to the right, take inspiration from the Cathedral of Saint-Denis in France. We know that he visited the cathedral and the abbot there was developing Saint-Denis at roughly the same time. Wolsey, like other bishops' palaces in the period, made concessions to defence during the anarchy, though there is some debate over whether these were seriously intended to improve defence or were instead somewhat for show. One of these features is the garderobe or latrine tower at the south -est east corner of the East Hall, which was fortified following the rout of Winchester in September 1141. Considering the very domestic function of the tower, its external fortification raises the possibility that this was an attempt by Henry to imbue one of his residences with an aura of military strength rather than serve as a true military feature. Similarly, what is sometimes known as the keep of the palace looked formidable near the outside but actually housed a great kitchen. The fact that Henry was in a more vulnerable position after changing sides twice between his brother Stephen and cousin Matilda during the rout may have prompted him to strengthen the appearance of Wolsey. Moving on from defensive considerations, Bishop Henry's palace at Wolsey was a magnificent and luxurious residence. This is a picture I took of the northern end of the East Hall a couple of years ago. The blind arcading, meaning decorative arch elements, can be seen, and a real sense of the grandeur of the hall can be felt. So the floor of the hall would have actually been at first floor level and from there been open to the roof. You can hopefully see the more pointed blind arcading corresponding to the arches in the reconstruction of the hall on the right, which helps illustrate how tall and impressive Henry's great hall actually would have been when intact. Wolsey wasn't just an isolated and grand residence of a high status bishop, but an economic and administrative centre set in a central position of elite trade networks. Palaces like Wolsey, Bishop's Waltham and Mount House at Whitney were associated with the more everyday sites of neighbouring or nearby farms that have regrettably seen very little archaeological investigation compared to their more high status counterparts. We are lucky to have the exceptionally well surviving records of the Bishopric of Winchester that tells of one instance serving as an early example of how far reaching these networks could be. A feast prepared for the newly appointed Bishop William Raleigh on St Edmund's Day, that's the 20th of November, um, 12 people. At this time, manors across Hampshire, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, Wiltshire and Surrey were drawn upon to transport various goods. These included elite meats such as venison from Farnham and Bishop's Waltham, vast quantities of ceramics from Eshenswell and Highclere, fish primarily from Orsford, and five tonnes of wine shipped from Portsmouth. 
Over 100 years later, in 1393, freshwater fish were transported to the palace for a royal feast from as far away as Somerset. People such as servants, craftsmen and farmers, the bishop himself, animals and other goods all travelled across this intricate network with Wolsey at its centre. So to wrap up, I really like to think of Wolsey as a site that bridges the gap between the medieval period and the present day, with the current Bishop of Winchester's residence being right next door. I was first attracted to the site as it's a sort of romantic ruin nestled in the heart of the city, but the complex and powerful historical figures like Henry of Blois, who visited and lived at Wolfsey, as well as the economic and administrative hub that it was, bring these quiet ruins to life. In my opinion, the best way to approach complicated sites like this one is by combining historical details such as records of trade, events and people's lives with archaeological evidence such as analysis of the structure, for instance, its defensive capabilities and artistic inspirations. As I live quite near to Winchester, it was a great opportunity to be able to learn all about such a fascinating local site and engage with both excavation records and wider literature. So I hope you found this interesting. Thank you for listening. And I recommend visiting the site if you have the opportunity. And these are my references.